All right, so welcome everyone back to 264A Automated Reasoning. Today we will be talking about compiling the input-output behavior of some machine learning systems into symbolic representations. Uh, we've seen last time uh, what one may do if uh, one is successful in indeed capturing the input-output behavior of a machine learning system symbolically. We looked, for example, at uh, explaining decisions or uh, finding the culprit behind decisions, where we looked at both MC explanations and PI explanations, which we also called uh, sufficient reasons. Uh, we saw how that can also be used in reasoning more broadly about decisions, uh, including decision bias, and how you can use these symbolic representations to even reason about the robustness of decisions and classifiers. Uh, today, we'll take a look at the process of doing that compilation, and we will look at that in the context of three different uh, machine learning systems, uh, Bayesian network classifiers, a very limited type of neural networks, and decision trees and random forests. And you'll see that each one of them bring its own challenges and um, subtleties. Uh, but that should uh, give you a sense of what's really involved and uh, what needs to be um, done there. So we'll get started by heading to the whiteboard. All right, so here's the big picture again from um, last time um, where we uh, basically have a machine learning system uh, that was learned from data. And this system, as we said, is uh, typically numeric. But we're going to capitalize on the fact that even though the system is numeric and learned from data, it it uh, often uh, represents a discrete function in the sense that um, the instance, which is the input to the machine learning system, is uh, a discrete object, and the output is also um, discrete. Now, this doesn't capture everything, but actually capture uh, an interesting class of machine learning systems. And as mentioned earlier, we will look at um, three classes of machine learning systems that have been quite popular. So our goal is to take this system and compile its input output behavior in symbolic form so that we can do the kind of things that uh, we mentioned um, last time. And what we'll do is start first by talking about uh, Bayesian network classifiers, but a restricted type of them, which is naive base classifiers. And before we even do that, we'll just talk again a little bit more about uh, Bayesian networks as far as background. And then we'll go into uh, neural networks, a specific type, binary neural networks, and then uh, decision trees and random forest. Now, one thing you'll see is that the compilation process from a conceptual point of view is uh, perhaps the easiest for random forest and then neural networks and then Bayesian networks. And the reason for this, and it will become apparent as we go on, is that this compilation process um, is really trying to capture um, this relation between input and output in its symbolic form. Now, this relation, you can think of it as an inference relation because I'm giving you an instance and you're doing some kind of inference to reach a decision, but there is a substantial difference between the complexity of that uh, reasoning process depending on what classifier you are talking about. It is simple, relatively speaking, for random forest and neural networks compared to Bayesian networks, because as you will see, the reasoning process is pretty straightforward. It's a feed forward uh, evaluation of some creature. There is no subtleties there. For Bayesian networks, it's, it's a different story because the reasoning process that takes you from an, in an instance to a decision is quite complex. So you'll see as a result, um, this is conceptually much more difficult and will just uh, give you a sense of what's going on with naive base classifiers. Um, all right, so let's get started here. And this is a Bayesian network. We talked about this before. We'll familiarize you uh, with it. Um, a little bit more again, but what we mentioned is that it is uh, one way of representing um, 
probability distributions, you have uh, some kind of a graph. It's actually directed a cyclic graph, typically referred to as the causal structure. And it's meant to represent uh, your perceptions of causal influences. The situation concerns um, a disease or a condition and two tests that bear on it. And one of these tests is also um, sensitive to the gender of the person. And we have this uh, basically variable, which was meant to capture whether the two tests are or came out the same or not. And to fully specify a Bayesian network, you need to specify what we call the conditional probability tables or uh, what's known as the CPTs. Um, and you need one for each variable in your Bayesian network. Um, for root nodes, it's simple. It's just a distribution over the values of that root node. For nodes that have parents, that table specifies a distribution for the variable conditioned on every state of the parents. So you can see the CPT for the condition here. It's actually two distributions, uh, one conditioned on being male and one conditioned on being female and so on. And as we mentioned before, people are typically interested in uh, posing different kind of queries with, res with respect to the distributions induced by these models. So we went and talked about MPE, MAR, MAP, and SDP. And um, as you can see, uh, these are all difficult uh, problems. So doing inference on these guys is not straightforward. In contrast, to neural networks and uh, decision trees and random forest, where the inference is pretty easy and is basically linear in the size of your classifier, not here. Now we're going to just very quickly go over these uh, and and point out that this query mar is the one that gets used typically to do classification. All right, and then we'll talk a little bit about naive Bayes uh, classifiers, which are special case of Bayesian network classifiers uh, because we're going to be focusing on these uh, next. So, um, right, this is uh, the Bayesian network again blown up. But um, before we talk about the queries quickly, one question we need to settle is what is the distribution that is specified uh, by a Bayesian network? Um, because remember, these queries here are all questions about a distribution that is induced by the uh, Bayesian network. And uh, turns out the story is relatively simple. We've seen this before. Let's just do it again. This is a simple Bayesian network with three variables, uh, A, B, C, and they're all binary. And you can see these numbers, uh, which are the CPTs. We call these the parameters. So this is the CPT for A has two numbers, two parameters. CPT4B has four parameters, two distributions, and similarly for C. And it happens that the distribution that's induced by this Bayesian network is uh, can be easily described. Really, it's simply, okay, we, we're uh, going here and uh, enumerating all possible instantiations for the variables in the Bayesian network. And we just need to show you how to compute the probability of each one of these instantiations. And that defines what is a distribution that's induced by a Bayesian network. And the story turns out to be pretty simple. Uh, every probability here end up being the product of a number of parameters where you go to every variable in the Bayesian network and just pull a parameter from the CPT for that. So you're going to pull a number from this, a number from this, and a number from that. And which parameters do you pull? You pull the ones that are consistent with your variable instantiation. So you can see here what we pulled for A, what we pulled for B, what we pulled for C. And similar, if you go down here, this is where every variable is false. These are the parameters that uh, we basically pull. Now, why is this the case? Um, that's another story, but I just want to make one observation because we're going to use it um, at a high level next, which is what makes these models interesting is that this distribution that is induced from a Bayesian network exhibit behaviors that you can conclude by simply um, examining the causal structure without even looking at the numbers. Because you have to realize that this distribution is a function of two things, a function of the numbers and the topology of the Bayesian network. So for example, one of the main things that um, these models are known for is that I can infer independence from only examining the causal structure. Now, what is independence? 
Independence is when I come and tell you, we have observed the value of the first test. Would that change your mind about the second test? If it does, then I will, these are not independent. But it turns out in this case, even though knowing something about T1 may change your mind about T2, like I tell you this test came out positive. You can imagine that will make your belief in T2 being positive go up. But it turns out in this model, if I also tell you what the gender of the patient and whether they have the condition or not, if we start by telling you this information, then these become independent. Telling you the result of T1 will not change your mind about T2, okay? And actually the reasoning algorithms that end up performing inference on this end up using that kind of information, which end up being uh, more involved compared to the other two creatures we're gonna see. All right. so. Um, here we go. Uh, just very quickly, uh, the queries that we mentioned, uh, because we're going to talk about them again later, about how to compute them uh, using the techniques that we did in our class. Uh, the first one was pretty uh, straightforward. That's the MPE, uh, where I give you, let's say, the value of some variables, and I want to know what's the most likely state of all other variables. In this case, someone did the two tests, they came out the same. What's the most likely state of these two, uh, four variables? And here's one most likely instantiation, a female that does not have the condition and both tests came out negative. And the second query, which will be used um, or typically used to build classifiers and the one we will use later is what's known as MAR or computing marginal probabilities, right? So this is where you come and tell me, okay, someone did the first test and it came out positive. They did the second test that came out positive. Uh, what is the probability that they are uh, male? Now we're computing this probability and it is this kind of query that's used to build classifiers because what happens typically is you have a threshold uh, and you say, okay, if the probability is greater than 80% uh, of being male, then I'm gonna declare the person as male. Otherwise, um, okay, that maybe a threshold is not good. Let's say 0.5. So if the probability is uh, greater than 0.5, then I'll declare them a male, otherwise is a female. So what's happening here is your classifier is effectively taking two inputs, um, uh, T1, and T2 and just going ahead and generating uh, uh, male, female as uh, the output, all right? Uh, but to do that, it's actually performing a MAR query. And this is the one with that we will, uh, the kind of classifier that we'll talk about compiling in just a little bit. All right, and we've seen also the MAP query, which generalizes MPE, same story. You give me some evidence and I'm gonna try to find the most likely state, but in this case, you supply the variables. Uh, we're not doing it over all uh, variables. In this case, uh, finding the most likely state of these two guys end up being uh, male uh, that doesn't have the condition. And finally, uh, the SDP, and here's there's a subtlety. So the SDP is the more difficult query. And um, it, it is actually in the context of classifiers that, like which we just mentioned, but let's make a distinction here. So here's the Bayesian network. And let's say I'm gonna use it as a classifier as we just mentioned earlier. You tell me scanning test, blood test, urine test. I compute a posterior over pregnancy, check against the threshold, in this case, 90%. And then I render a decision, yes, no, pregnant. Okay, that's classification as we've seen. For that, you just need uh, the marginal probability query but this goes further. This is not just doing classification. This query is now trying to reason about how your classifications may change. So um, in this case, I tell you, fine, you concluded uh, this instance to be not pregnant based on the, the fact that the scanning test was false. What would happen if I further give you the values of urine and blood? Uh, so I'm trying to do a, an expectation. And this says, listen, I mean, it's 78 0.7 chance that this classification will not change. That's value of information, that's more. We're not doing this today. We're just focusing on the classification and assuming that we have a full instance because this is not a full instance, right? When I gave you scanning, I didn't tell you everything about the instance. I just gave you something partial. And this is also an interesting point to stress here because for Bayesian network classifiers, you can do that. 
I really don't need to give you the full instance to render a classification. I, any, any information I give you in, on the instance, I'm ready to go and make a classification because I'm using probabilistic reasoning. Whatever information you give me, I use it to compute the posterior. Uh, the other two creatures, that's not how they work. You really need the full uh, instance to be able to render a decision. And again, because there's more sophisticated uh, modeling and reasoning going here compared to the others. All right, a couple of words on naive base classifiers, which we will be focusing on next because we're going to be looking at how to compile them. A naive base classifier is a special case of a Bayesian network where the structure looks like this. I have this variable C, which is called the class variable. And then I have these children, and these are called the features. Okay, so it is simply a node with a bunch of children, a very famous. And uh, Remember the discussion about you can infer independence uh, by looking only at the structure. Okay, we didn't tell you how to do that. That would be more within the scope of a course on Bayesian networks. But in this case, it means that if you tell me what the class is, the features become independent. So in general, the features are not independent. If you give me some information about some features, that changes my mind about the other features. But not if we know the state of the variable C. We're going to use this fit, uh, uh, fact in a second. So what we try to do here is compute what we call the class posterior to do classification. And I'm going to show you the closed form for this because we're going to use it, right? So in general, you have to, uh, if you want to, if, if I give you an instance, like the value of these guys, like here, and we're going to later call this, you know, just one E to represent the values of all of these guys. And I tell you, what is the probability of distribution over this class variable given this instance, which I will need to do classification. Uh, for naive Bayes, because it's simple enough, you don't need a general algorithm to do that computation. In fact, there is a nice closed form and, and here's how it looks. Um, again, we're going over this because we're going to employ it uh, in just a little bit. What I'm doing here is computing the probability of the class. Let's say this uh, is a binary, has a positive or negative uh, value. So C, small c is the positive value. And I'm computing the probability over that given some instance. Uh, you can rewrite it this way. Now, how did we do that? Uh, if you remember when we did uh, some kind of overview of probabilities at some point, we said that the probability of um, alpha given beta, um, that's basically the probability of um, alpha and beta divided by the probability of beta. And we call this base conditioning. You get this by applying this twice. You may want to try it at home and sorry for the quality of the writing. Uh, so you, you can actually up, uh, get from this to that by applying this twice. And because these features are independent given C, you can further break this term like this. Okay, this is kind of the famous closed form um, for naive Bayes for computing the class posterior. Now, why is this an interesting form? Because what's happening here is I have probability of E1 given C, probability of E2 given C, probability of EN given C multiplied by the probability of C. Typically, this either can be unfolded or doesn't really play a role, and you'll see that. So let's not worry about this. But what is so special about this? Can someone tell me what is so special about this? Why would someone be happy to see this uh, as opposed to this or that? And ah, someone is saying, all of these quantities can be pulled directly from the CPT tables, absolutely. So I'm ready. I'm ready to evaluate this. I don't need to do any more inference. This I can pull from the CPT for E1. This I can pull from the CPT for E2. This I can pull from the CPT of the class variable. When I get to that situation, I'm ready to evaluate, right? OK, very good, very good. And actually, inference and algorithms more generally, that's what they try to do. You give them a quantity like this one, and what they're trying to do is rewrite it in terms of model parameters. And the quality of the algorithm in terms of its efficiency is the extent to which it is able to reduce the size of that rewrite or do it as fast or as efficiently as possible. Very good, folks. I just want to mention one more concept, and then we will go ahead and talk about compilation algorithm. And this is the concept of odds versus probability. Now, you. 
you probably all heard the notion of probability and all heard the notion of odds even before studying you know, probabilistic reasoning in a class, in statistics or in AI. These are terms that we use quite a bit in um, our daily language. Now, but odds mean something specific. So if we look at the class variable here, and let's say it has uh, only two states, uh, C and C prime, and this is the positive class value, this is the negative class value, then here's the probability of the positive class. Odds is simply the probability of an event divided by the probability of the negation of that event. So when I say, what is the odds of this guy? That is its probability over the probability of its negation. It's a quantity that helps in the sense that a lot of times when you're doing your analysis, uh, it is more convenient and more insightful to work with odds than with probabilities. And in fact, we'll see that exactly in just a little bit. Even more so is the, um, um, the other notion I'm going to mention in a second. But let me first show you that you can also talk about conditional odds. So this is, there is the probability of the class being positive given an instance. And that is the odds of that, which is simply the probability of the positive class given E divided by the probability of the negative class given E, okay? So we can talk about uh, conditional odds. And the one that ends up being used with odds is the notion of log odds. So instead of working with odds, I work with log odds. And that's simply applying log to this. And the reason it's convenient, and you may have seen this trick, quite a bit in computer science and machine learning, using logs uh, plays two purposes usually. Uh, when numbers are small, it helps, but also for mathematical manipulations, logs allow you to uh, replace um, basically multiplications uh, with additions. And you'll see how we're gonna use this to gain some major insight uh, later. Um, Yes, so someone is saying, what if this is zero? Uh, then basically, uh, that's basically uh, infinity. So while the probabilities um, range from zero to one, uh, the odds actually range from zero to infinity, okay? All right, now let's keep going. And now we're ready to talk about our first compilation algorithm. and. This will be just for naive Bayes classifiers, okay? We're not gonna treat general Bayesian networks and I'll tell you why, but the simple answer is you will need to know a lot more about Bayesian networks if we want to talk about the more general algorithm for Bayesian networks. But here's the naive Bayes classifier. We just talked about it. And as we've seen, it can be viewed in this case as representing a discrete function that maps discrete variables to a discrete output. And in fact, we've talked last time about how I can capture this uh, discrete function using an OBDD or a decision graph in the sense that I will get full agreement between this symbolic representation and this numeric representation on every instance. And uh, remember last time we threw these general question, you know, what else can I do this for? We're gonna see that today. What other tractable symbolic representations? Uh, we'll see that. What can we do with the symbolic representation? We've seen some examples of that. Now I want to show you how this works. And the main idea is even though we're you know, focusing on a very specific and restricted class, the insights are the same when you go to general Bayesian networks. So there's some very important insights there, two major things. And they get exploited similarly for the general case, but then to exploit them, as I said, you need to know a lot more about Bayesian networks, which is not as important for us for our purposes, okay? So as I mentioned, we're doing this, but there are algorithms that are more general. And in the description for the class video, we'll, we'll give you, for example, the reference for this if you're interested. And let me just mention something quickly here. This that we're gonna do, it will compile into binary decision diagrams. But uh, if you look at the original paper, for example, which we'll also post, it talks about not binary decision diagrams, but ordered decision diagrams. There is no binary there. Why? 
because these notions of binary decision diagrams or ordered binary decision diagrams can be easily generalized to the discrete case. In the binary case, I have a variable x, and then you, you say, is it uh, 0 or is it 1? Is it true or is it false? But in general, nothing prohibits from having a variable x that can have m multiple discrete values, like uh, low, high, and mid and basically everything works out. In fact, we will have to deal with this discrete case in the very last segment when we talk about uh, decision trees and random forest because that's pretty common there. And uh, so that's why you'll see ODDs instead of OBDDs for this particular reason. Okay, guys, let's get going here. And as I said, there are two major insights. What I'd like to really help you see is how can you really abstract away from numbers? Because it sounds a little bit magical at this point that I will give you a system like this, numbers everywhere, and then you have to do probabilistic reasoning to compute a classification. And suddenly I'm really getting rid of all of that and I give you something that's purely symbolic. So there's two, two insights there. One of them is the fact that really numbers don't matter as much when you're doing classification. In this case, I have a threshold, right, which is 0.9. And when I'm computing the posterior, I'm really just interested in knowing whether that posterior is greater than or equal to 0.9. That actually gives you quite a bit of leeway and surprisingly so. So let me show you an observation about this guy to give you a sense of what's going on here. So let's say here I have the class prior and it says, you know, hands off, uh, a person is 87% uh, pregnant. Okay, this example comes from a context of someone who was uh, gone through an artificial insemination procedure. And this is actually uh, the prior probability of pregnancy, which represents the success of that procedure. And it turns out that if I go and work with a different classifier uh, where the prior is not this, the prior is this. So I dropped it from 87% to 68.4%. Okay. Well, guess what? Because of these numbers and because of the topology of this, this will not change the classifier. If you go and try this guy on every possible instance, there's not a lot of them here, just eight, and see how this guy will classify and how this guy will classify with the new prior, you're going to find that they agree on every instance. Doesn't matter. And in fact, you can take this guy and, and move it up to 97% and the same story. That doesn't change the classifier. Okay. And the reason is I'm doing classification uh, based on a threshold. Uh, and that gives us the notion, which is uh, important in uh, the classification uh, or compilation procedure for Bayesian network, which is the notion of an equivalence interval. In this context, the interval is this. And as long as your class prior is in this interval, you've got the same exact classifier. So what we have here is an equivalent class of classifiers, uh, numeric classifiers that all map to the same symbolic classifier. Okay, that's one of these ideas. And the other idea that now we're going to put this with um, will get us almost there as far as showing you a very concrete compilation algorithm, super cool. Uh, this is actually, as I said earlier, due to Hei Chan, uh, was one of our past PhD students. The other idea to really have it materialize and see it vividly, we're gonna work with log odds instead of probabilities. So in, instead of doing classification this way, let's compute the posterior on the class given the instance and check against a probability threshold. Let's actually work in log odds space. Okay, so now I'm using this as my score for the instance. I want you to imagine this because this is going to be very important for what we're going to do next. You need to think of the classifier or the Bayesian network as taking an instance and producing a score for it. If we're working in probability space, that's the score, right? What is the probability that the class is positive given that it's, that's a number? And just I'm checking against the threshold, right? So think of this as a score for that guy. We're doing the same thing here except the score is now this, is the log odds of the positive class given the instance. And the threshold is P over one minus P rho. Okay, now see the, in the next slide. The next slide will take this score for an instance and rewrite it in a certain form. And then you'll see some really fundamental insights going on there. Uh, okay, 
here's the slide. It, it, it looks um, subtle, it's not. In fact, we already did the prep work for this. I'm just trying to rewrite the score for an instance, the score that I'm gonna to use to decide whether that instance is uh, positive or negative. Uh, that's just straight out definition of log odds. We've gone over this. Taking this guy, which is the posterior and plugging in the formula we showed earlier, we get this, okay? So I showed you how we got this. And, and to do this, as you recall, we had to invoke this notion of independence of features given the class. And we just did the same thing for this guy. We rewrote it that way, okay? Now, these two terms cancel. And because the way logs behave with products and divisions, you can rewrite this in the following form. It's just straightforward manipulations. You don't need probabilistic reasoning for that. And now look what happened. I have two terms. I have this guy, which is called the prior log odds, right? That's the probability of the class being positive divided by the probability of class being negative, which is just the division of these two guys. And here's what's interesting is this other term where I have one of these guys for every feature. So it's a summation. Now what's happening here? Uh, for every feature in the instance or every characteristic, I compute the probability of seeing that characteristic given a positive class divided by probability of seeing that characteristic given a negative class. We're going to take this whole quantity and represent it by this uh, symbol, the weight of that particular characteristic. Okay. So if you had a feature uh, in this case, which would be, let's say, uh, gender then that variable will have two values, male and female. You're going to get a weight for each one of them, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about this rewrite. Remember, this is a score of an instance that I'm going to use to decide whether it's positive or negative because I'm going to check this against the threshold. Now, we rewrote it in the following way. I want you to make observe an observation about this rewrite. There are two terms. And this term is actually special in a particular way. Anybody can make an observation about this guy compared to this guy. Remember, I have an instance E, which is just a vector of characteristics, values of features, and I'm trying to score it. And then I, I'm, I'm scoring it in this fashion, all right? And the, the, the observation that I want you to look at is which one of these depend on the instance? Um, this clearly depends on the instance. These weights clearly depend on the instance because I'm going to every characteristic in the instance and computing this weight, which has to relate to the probability of that characteristic given positive class, given negative class. This guy does not depend on the instance. This guy is not dependent on the instance. And that's going to be now a major insight that we're gonna use next and we'll be almost ready to show you the compilation algorithm, okay? So I rewrote this score into two components. One that does not depend on the instance, it's shared between all instances and another component that actually does depend on the instance. Now, what are the implications of this? Okay, we'll make that implication, uh, go over that implication and we're almost there. The implication is this, is how is the classifier affected by changing the class prior? What happens to it? What this visualization is doing is taking all of your instances, an exponential number of them, and putting them on a line depending on their score. This is, this is the score. This is the uh, number attached to an instance that I'm going to use to do the classification. So I'm going to take all of the instances, distinct instances, an exponential number of them, and I put them on a line. And this is my threshold. So these are the negative instances. These are the positive instances. Let's say we're checking whether the score is greater than or equal to rho, okay? So now here's the observation. What happens if I change the class prior? Look at it here. What happens if I change that? These scores will all shift by the same amount. Exactly. They will shift by the same amount. Now, look, look at this. Suppose I increase the log odds, right? So these guys are going to go, the, the prior log odds, these guys are going to go this way, right? So they're going to shift. Everything is going to shift. As long as this shift does not cross the threshold or does not touch, touch the threshold, that classifier doesn't change. So let's call this the original classifier F. I changed the cl class prior, and then I got a new classifier F1. As long as 
this instance here, which you can think of as the most negative instance, as long as it doesn't touch row, classifier is exactly the same. They didn't change, correct? Now, if I increase it just a little bit, so it, it hits row, then now this is gonna be classified positively, not negatively anymore. And this new classifier is not equivalent to the original one. So you've got a leeway here, which is based on this guy here. As long as you increase by that amount, you're good. And similarly for decreasing. So if you decrease the uh, class prior, you're gonna shift all instances by the same amount this way. Now, I'm still good, right? Th this was the least positive. It's still positive. So even though I did this shift, everything that was negative remains negative. Everything that was positive remains positive. So now this F3 classifier is the same as the original one. But if I do it a little bit more, where this guy now becomes negative, the classifier has changed, okay? So now you can see what's going on. And in fact, this particular rewrite tells you about how much leeway you have, and that ends up being the basis of the notion of um, an equivalence interval, okay? That gives you a sense where the abstraction is happening and why I can move away from numbers and give you things. Okay. Um, one more insight, one more insight, which is actually something that is uh, very broadly applicable beyond this. A lot of these computations uh, use this notion and you've seen it before. Uh, so you should not be surprised by it. And this is the notion of an equivalent subclassifiers. We make this observation and I can show you the algorithm, which you will be familiar with actually given everything that we've done uh, before. So what is a subclassifier? I have this classifier over three variables. And let's say I come and tell you, you know what? I know the value of the urine test. What happens? What happens is you're gonna go now and compute the posterior on this guy. And then you're gonna get different numbers there. We've seen that, right? The point is you can think of the result of that process as having constructed what we call a subclassifier, a classifier over a smaller number of features. Because now I can actually, if, if you're going to come back and tell me, oh, but I also know the blood test, I know the scanning test. I just work with this new subclassifier, which is exactly like the previous one, except that I have less features and a different class prior. So you can take this guy as the new creature and say, let me use this guy to do the classification once you give me the values of these. Now, the main observation is, this is the notion of a subclassifier. Now, what's the notion of an equivalent subclassifier as well? Okay, here I told you the value of urine was red. And what if I tell you, no, the value was actually green. What happens here? You're gonna get a different subclassifier. And the only difference between the two is the class prior, okay? The point is, it is possible that the red number and the green number fall within the same equivalence interval, which means that whether under U red or under U uh, green, I'm gonna get the same subclassifier in the sense that if I compile this to a symbolic representation or I compile this to a symbolic representation, I'm gonna get the same symbolic classifier. Now, someone is saying that in this case, in a sense, uh, this guy was not relevant, Yes, but it gets interesting in the context of more variables. So we're going to see it in just a second uh, in, a, in a more contextual uh, setting. So these algorithms really rely on identifying subclassifiers and trying to avoid um, recompiling them. We've seen that notion. We've seen that notion in knowledge compilation when we were compiling a Boolean formula into a circuit, let's say top-down compilation, where we're compiling a Boolean formula and CNF into a different kind of tractable circuits. Uh, do you guys remember what that notion was called? Uh, when we were trying to avoid uh, recompiling sub-expressions or things that we called residual formulas in the context of top-down compilation, we called it formula caching. Uh, you can think of this as something similar except we're doing subclassifier caching, okay? So these algorithms, whether for naive Bayes or the more general Bayesian networks, rely on 
identifying these subclassifiers and avoiding uh, the rec recompilation. Very fundamental notion and appears throughout. It's, it's one of these very important computational tricks that you use everywhere. Okay, guys, now we're ready to show you the algorithm and it, you'll see it's pretty simple with everything we know so far is gonna be straightforward. Here it is. I wanna compile this guy. It's a naive base classifier. And if, if you really just want to compile this into something symbolic and you don't worry about computation complexity, well, it's pretty easy. Go and compile it to a decision tree, right? I can always do this. I'm not, we're not worrying about complexity. This guy's going to be exponential, but the point is you can go from numeric to symbolic very easily. How? Build the whole tree. Start with this variable, positive, negative. This guy, positive, negative, da, 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 da. You're going to reach these things. So positive, negative, positive. What's the label? Should be either yes or no. Well, I can fill that very easily. I have an instance. Add it to this guy. Compute the posterior check against threshold. Do you get yes or no? Put the label here, yes or no. Okay, so you can see how you can do this easily if you don't care about uh, computation and uh, efficiency in terms of the size of this guy and how much to get it. The main insight is you couple this idea with the idea of sub equivalent subclassifiers. And remember, the notion of equivalent subclassifiers is tied to the notion of equivalence intervals. So if you look at this, this uh, decision tree here and you look at this uh, subset, what happened here? I set U to positive and B to negative. That is a subclassifier. Okay, it's a subclassifier that includes only one feature over S and an updated prior. Now, it's not the original prior of 87%, it's this prior, okay? So this guy here is what? Is the compilation of a subclassifier, right? Now, if you look here as well, that's also a, a subclassifier, but it's a different one. This was when I set U and B this way, this is when I set U and B that way. Positive, negative, negative, positive. So it's another subclassifier. It's exactly like this. The only difference is the class prior. If these happen to be the same subclassifier, I wouldn't need these two portions. Um, I would have the situation. And now I have a decision graph. So if you look at the decision tree, you're going to find that there are uh, duplicate portions that correspond to equivalent subclassifiers. So what this algorithm does, it doesn't of course go and construct the whole decision tree and then prune it, that would already incur an exponential cost. What it does is just similar to what we did in top-down compilation. It will do a depth first search in the space of features. And as it's going down, so it, it did this and uh, it compiled that. At every step, it caches the subclassifier with the equivalence interval. And when it's going on down that path, before it tries to compile this guy, it says, did I have a, a, a subclassifier that falls within the same uh, equivalence interval? Did I have, is the subclassifier that I have here equivalent to some other subclassifier that I did? And if it does recognize that it doesn't actually recompile this, but just point to the previous one. So the, the core of this algorithm is simply a depth first search uh, while being able to identify and recognize equivalent subclassifiers. And that depends on being able to compute equivalence intervals, which we didn't talk about here. So uh, I'm gonna give you a pointer to a lecture on our YouTube channel, which is just dedicated to this algorithm. If you're interested in knowing all of the internal details of the caching mechanism, uh, because that would require computing these equivalence intervals efficiently and incrementally, and you can do that. But then we'll have to do more math related to Bayesian networks. And that's basically it. Now we've gone from a naive base classifier to an OBDD. Uh, for general Bayesian networks, it's a similar algorithms, but the notion of subclassifiers get more involved and the notion of caching. And to be able to do this, you have to really reason about more complex patterns of deseparation, uh, which are the particular way independence is detected in Bayesian networks. So we will need the notion of deseparation to even talk about this, which is another subject. Uh, but if you want to go more into the, at least the naive Bayes uh, classification algorithm, because there's still a hidden component there about caching. This lecture from the class that I teach on Bayesian networks is actually dedicated for this. And it also talks more about what can you do 
uh, with these symbolic representations beyond what we talked about earlier. Um, and uh, I think that is what I want to say for this part. And uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, it's really interesting to see the outcomes of these compilation algorithms uh, because you get the logic, the numeric and probabilistic logic uh, expressed very uh, symbolically, like in this uh, particular case. All right, folks, so this, this basically is what I wanted to say about these guys. Let's take our break, and when we come back, we will talk about uh, compiling the input-output behavior of a specific type of neural networks and then um, decision trees and the random forest. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 